This is a FarmDoc Daily Webinar. I'm University of Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason. Thank you for joining us today. Financial and environmental impacts of conservation practices. We'll talk a bit about this conservation program we call PCM, Precision Conservation Management. It can always be found online at precisionconservation.org. Our presenters for the day from the University of Illinois will include Gary Schnicki, agricultural economist Sarah Sellers, who is a PhD student here on campus. Lori Gentry joins us from the Illinois Corn Growers along with the director of PCM, Greg Goodwin. In fact, Greg's going to kick us off for the day. Good morning to you, Greg. Thank you for being with us. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and then begin our program, please? Excellent. Yeah, thank you, Todd, and thank you to the whole University of Illinois uh, Farm Doc team for hosting and producing this webinar. Um, and good morning and thank you for joining us today. As Todd mentioned, I am the I'm Greg Goodwin uh, with the Illinois Corn Growers Association and the director of the Precision Conservation Management Program. Uh, PCM is a by the farmers for the farmers service program that currently works throughout Illinois, uh, parts of Kentucky and Nebraska, with approximately 400 farmers on 400,000 acres. And today, I would just like to provide a brief introduction to our program and what we're all about. So here at PCM, uh, we work to aid farmers along their path to conservation practice adoption and approach this in a variety of ways. Uh, we have helped farmers to understand how conservation practices impact their farm and net returns and help them to understand how they are addressing water quality concerns and working to prevent agricultural regulation and by helping farmers position themselves to benefit from positive conservation outcomes. And so how do we do this? Um, we do this by trying to address precisely what growers are looking for when thinking about adopting conservation management strategies on their farm. And we do this through one-on-one -on -one technical support, um, a data collection platform to streamline data entry and ease farmer burden, and providing individual resource analysis and assessment plans or RAP reports, which include economic cost tables, environmental assessments, local practice comparisons to help farmers see how their management approaches compare to others taking similar management approaches, uh, different management approaches, and how they compare against farmers of similar land types or regionally. Um, and as we know, uh, your time is valuable. Uh, we also offer participation payments of $750 just for signing up and entering your data. Uh, and we also offer access to assistance with enrollment into an exclusive programs that provide incentives or cost share for conservation practice adoption. And we offer networking and peer-to-peer -peer education opportunities through field days and other similar events. And so just to provide a bit of background, uh, the PCM program was launched by the Illinois Corn Growers Association in 2015 through a regional conservation partnership program or RCPP grant through the NRCS for three and a half million dollars. And this was really done to help address agriculture's contributions to nutrient loading in the Gulf of Mexico and help Illinois farmers work towards the goals outlined in the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy. And uh, just as a reminder, um, as you can see here, the ultimate goal of this strategy is for a 45% reduction in total nitrogen and total phosphorus losses by 2035 with an interim goal of a 15% reduction in nitrate nitrogen and a 25% reduction in total phosphorus by 2025. And for those who may not follow these reports closely, uh, we still have a long way to go in hitting those goals. And as everybody knows, 2025 is, is just right around the corner. And to provide a little bit of uh, context to our current footprint and the size of our team, uh, we currently have nine full-time conservation specialists who work directly with farmers in 30 counties in Illinois, 10 in Kentucky, and three in Nebraska. Um, and as you may have noticed, uh, like what seems to be the case in the rest of the world, we are hiring. So if you happen to know anyone who may be interested in joining PCM, uh, please encourage them to uh, look for our posting. And like every other successful program, um, this one would not be successful without the help of our amazing partners, uh, specifically those like the Illinois Soybean Association who came on as an equal funding partner to Illinois Corn in 2020. 
and they are helping to provide additional technical support and direction to the program, primarily through their uh, very talented agronomy team. Um, and in addition, we also have been successful due to our cor corporate partnerships, uh, such as the one with PepsiCo and others in their uh, supply chain who have stepped up to the plate to help us develop uh, custom incentive programs to provide assistance to farmers for conservation practice adoption. Um, and in total, you'll see that we have over 30 partners on this list, um, all who have either committed cash resources or in-kind match to our federal grants. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to list them all today, but uh, we could not be successful without them and we cannot thank them enough for providing their support to farmers uh, throughout this program. And uh, here I just wanted to remind everyone that the uh, new, newest version of our annual data summary, the uh, business case for conservation has just been re released in the June Prairie Farmer Magazine. Uh, please check this out. And if you did not get a copy and would like one, uh, please reach out to us and we can get that for you. And uh, just getting back a bit to the nuts and bolts of our of PCM, our program does focus on infield management and the uh, practice standards we focus on are tillage, nitrogen management and cover crops. And uh, the other speakers today will go into more detail about these, but uh, we certainly support all the other groups that are focused on other types of conservation. But uh, this is for us we, where we feel our time is best spent. Um, these practices, you know, touch every acre, and so uh, we feel by helping farmers make even small changes on on these acres, um, this equates to large environmental out impacts and and uh, good outcomes. And so, uh, with that, I'll turn it over to our first uh, speaker that will go into the data, uh, which is Sarah Sellers, to tell us more about cover crops. And we'll start actually with Sarah in just a moment. Thank you, Greg. Uh, I would like uh, to point you to now taking a poll. This is pretty simple and easy, should have popped up or is going to pop up on your page there. We'd like to know whether you expect another federal crop program uh, making payments for cover crop usage and whether you think that'll be over $20 an acre, less than $20 an acre, or whether you just simply do not expect another program, we'll let you make um, that answer uh, as we're giving you our sponsors for the day, by the way. They include the TIA Center for Farmland Research that's here on campus. You can find that page at farmland.illinois.edu, along with Compere Financial, Corteva AgriScience, uh, Farm Credit Illinois, FS Growmark, the Illinois Corn Growers Association, and the Illinois Soybean Association. So we'll look to have you complete that survey in just a moment. Go ahead and take the survey and the poll. Again, the question is, do you expect another federal crop program making payments for cover crop usage? Yeah, sure I do. $20 an acre or more, uh, $20 an acre or less, or simply know that I do not expect to have another cover crop um, program in place. Go ahead and close that one out, and we'll show you that uh, we're pretty equally divided in a, a U-shape <laughs> across uh, this with 30% uh, saying $20 or more, 50% uh, of you saying $20 or less, and 20% of you saying no. Sellers, uh, Sarah Sellers now joins us, and she's going to take us through the next set of our program with a cover crops overview. Good morning to you, Sarah. Good morning, Todd. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. So today I'll be talking about uh, the cover crop fields that we have in the data set. So first, I, I just want to start out by giving you an overview of what that looks like. Um, I want to mention that most farmers um, in this data set are enrolled in a cover crop cost share program, the ones who are doing cover crops. Um, there are about five different cost share opportunities for farmers in PCM that provide anywhere between $5 to $35 per acre. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind is these cost share programs are not factored into the financial information that I'm going to show in the slides. So. Overall, we have 1,750 cover crop fields. Most of these are overwintering, but we do have some terminal cover crops. And as for crop type, uh, we see people using cover crops on corn, soybeans, or both, but most of those are um, on soybean fields. 
Now, the next thing we wanted to look at is, so those people who are using cover crops, uh, what other practices are they also using? So what we find is our, our cover crop farmers are conservation all-stars. So we see that um, the cover crop fields, most of them are, are also using reduced tillage. So 91% are in our reduced tillage benchmarks, which are the no-till, strip-till, or one-pass light benchmarks. We see that 79% of our cover crop Corn fields receive an in-season nitrogen application. And we also see that 60% of our cover crop corn fields uh, receive a nitrogen application at or below the MRTN, which is the university nitrogen recommendation. And we're going to talk about that a little more. I know Dr. Schnicki is going to talk about the MRTN in the nitrogen section, but I just wanted to briefly mention that. So what we find is our, our cover crop farmers are using reduced tillage. They're applying nitrogen in season and, and they're using less nitrogen. So for the next part, we also wanted to look at of the people who are doing cover crops, do they continue doing cover crops in, in future years? So what we find is that if we look at all the corn fields that have a cover crop, 70% uh, 70, 70 of those fields have a, a cover crop the next time that that field is planted with corn. And, and we find similar for soybeans. We find that 75% have a cover crop the next time that that field is planted with soybeans. So what we see is the people in the data set who, who use cover crops, they continue using cover crops. So um, this shows that they are finding value in, in what they're doing there. And first I wanna talk about um, planting cover crops on going into corn. So uh, these are our results for our corn fields. These are on high productivity soils. And these are averages from 2015 to 2021. So we broke these out by our categories. Uh, we have overwintering, winter terminal, and no cover crops. So on average, we do see that the, the cover crop fields had a, a lower yield than the fields without cover crops. And if we look across the soil productivity ratings, we can see uh, these fields are, are pretty similar. We also can see some differences in, in our revenue and our costs. So um, we, do, we do see that, that the average gross revenue is a little bit higher for our fields without cover crops. And um, we do see that our winter terminal had the lowest total non-land cost. And we're gonna break that out a little bit in the next slide and, and kind of go over the costs. Um, so, and when we look at the operator land returns, we, we do see on average uh, the fields with no cover crops did have the highest operator land return. Uh, but there are a couple things I, I wanna mention about this. Uh, first, I know maybe this is not exactly what we want to see or hear because we know there's a lot of positive benefits of, of cover crops. Um, but we do know that there are costs uh, that the farmer has to incur to grow these cover crops. And this will make a difference in the budget. And I'll kind of break out some of those costs in the next slide. But another big thing to keep in mind is that the, the number of uh, cover crop fields in the data set is relatively low. And a lot of these farmers are growing cover crops for the first time. So um, these, these farmers are, are newer to this. They're, they're still learning and they're still trying to figure out how to do this profitably. So that's something I really wanna emphasize uh, because we do know there is a learning curve and it does take a few years to get this figured out. So I'm, I'm really excited to kind of see what happens when we, when we get even more years of data uh, looking at those same farms. But um, that's another thing to keep in mind. And again, I want to mention that the cost share program is not factored into the operator land returns. So if, if we factored in uh, what the farmers of PCM do receive, um, or, you know, if it, if we cover that cost of seed and planting for the cover crops, then that, that brings these numbers much closer together. So that's another thing to keep in mind. And again, uh, this is purely financial data. So we know that there are, are other benefits to growing cover crops, such as benefits to soil health, benefits for water quality, benefits to the environment. So these, these benefits that are being provided are also not factored into this. So just some things to keep in mind when, when we're looking at our cover crops results. And next, I wanna look at a breakdown of our cover crop costs on our corn field. So we have our direct cost, 
our, our power cost, and these are the power costs without the cover crop planting costs. Then we have our overhead cost. Uh, then we have the cover crop seed and planting costs. And these are what make up our total non-land costs. So um, cover crops on average had had lower field work costs. So that's why we see some, some difference in the power costs. Um, and we do see some slightly higher machinery costs on the overwintering, uh, probably due to the, the cost of killing those cover crops. Um, and we do see a slightly higher average pesticide cost on the overwintering, which factors into the direct cost. Again, it's probably also from uh, killing the overwintering cover crops. When we look at the differences in direct cost, uh, we see that the no cover crop is higher. And on average, the no cover crop had a higher nutrient supplied cost. So what we see is they are using more inputs on these no cover crop fields, and that's accounting for some of this difference in the direct costs. And then we also do have uh, some extra costs from, for, from planting the cover crops. That's $25 for cover crop seed and planting on the overwintering cover crops and $29 per acre uh, to cover that seed and planting cost for the winter terminal. <clears throat> Next, we're going to talk about um, our soybean fields. So this is planting cover crops before soybeans. First, we'll, we'll take a look at the cost. So again, these are high productivity soils, and these are averages from 2015 to 2021. So we do see, uh, again, we broke this out by direct costs, power costs, overhead costs, cover crop seed and planting costs, and these are what make up our non-land costs. So uh, we do see a little bit of a difference at the power cost. Uh, so the overwintering is probably slightly higher, again, due to, the, due to that extra pass for killing off the cover crops. The average direct and overhead costs are, are pretty comparable between the categories. And then again, we have that cover crop cost. So for overwintering, that's $23 per acre to cover the cover crop seed and planting. And for winter terminal, uh, that's $29 per acre for that cover crop seed and planting. So these are our costs for soybeans. And now again, we're going to look at our, our, our yield and our returns. So again, we do find on average our highest operator and land return is our no cover crop fields, uh, followed by our winter terminal, and then our overwintering fields. Um, again, we do see a, a slightly higher yield on no cover crops, which accounts for some of that financial difference we see. Um, we also do have some, so, some higher non-land costs for soybeans with cover crops. Um, again, I will mention that we, we know that there are costs to growing cover crops, as, as I showed you in the data, and that this will affect the budget and outcome. We're not factoring in this, this cost share that's being covered. And again, most of our farmers are new to this. They're still learning. Uh, we know it definitely takes a few years and you know some trial and error to, to figure out cover crops. So um, keep that in mind when, when looking at the data. So, and when we do factor in that cost share, we see that the, the cover crop and no cover crop become more uh, competitive with each other. So now I'll turn it over to Dr. Schnitke, who's gonna cover the nitrogen rates and tillage. Yeah, and we're going to do nitrogen rates and tillage, and we're going to, again, start out with a question here. And Todd, if you want to take this away, we'll sure do the I question. Will. Absolutely. What are your expectations uh, in this poll for the anhydrous ammonia prices for application in late fall of 2022? Over $2,000 a ton, $1,500 to $2,000 per ton, $1,000 to $1,500, or less than $1,000 a ton. So when you go to do your fall applications this year for anhydrous ammonia, what do you expect to pay for that anhydrous per ton? And remember, uh, with MRTN, which stands for maximum return to nitrogen, you don't want to put any of this on before your soil temperatures fall to something like uh, 50 degrees or below permanently. That's for most of the upper two-thirds of the state of Illinois the third week or later in October, the bottom third of the state of Illinois, not until, of course, the spring of next year. So um, we'll finish out this poll. Go ahead and uh, make your uh, choice there. Yeah. Do you think the price of application will be over $2,000, between $1,500 and $2,000, $1,000 to $1,500? 
or less than $1,000. Again, we would like to thank our sponsors for the day, including the TIA Center for Farmland Research, Compere Financial, Corteva Farm Credit, FS Growmark, the Illinois Corn Growers, and the Illinois Soybean Association. Let's go ahead and close our poll out at this point. And Gary, I'll let you go through some of the answers here. But again, looks fairly like a classic bell curve to me. Yeah, we're seeing some 10% that are reasonably pessimistic with over $2,000 per ton and 45% with uh, 15 to 2,000 and 40% 1,000 to 1,500. And then we have 5% that are optimistic here. So we will see where that all goes. Um, but j obviously this is, a, this is a big part of where we are at currently. Here are our fertilizer prices per ton in Illinois. The last number that we have there is 1607. That was in June. So uh, a week or so ago, we've seen some of that back off a little bit, but we're still looking at 1607, which is sort of between that, 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 that uh, values that we saw on our poll here. Last year, about this time, or actually in August, we were looking at uh, anhydrous ammonia prices of seven to eight hundred dollars per ton. We will be releasing our Illinois crop budgets not next week, but the week thereafter, and uh, we're still debating on what uh, nitrogen price to put in there. But it will likely be close to that sixteen hundred dollars per ton. Obviously, all DAP and potash prices have gone up as well. If we look at those prices and then use our MRTN, margin, maximum return to nitrogen, which is uh, Illinois and more broadly uh, Midwest states uh, nitrogen recommendations. If we look at central Illinois, which is where all these fields are at, even though we are expanding PCM next year um, or this year or already have expanded it, the, the data for that we're reporting here is primarily are all from central Illinois. Our MRTN based on that $1,600 price and a 675 corn price, which is what we're, what WASD is projecting for 2022, we would be looking at a uh, MRTN of 167 pounds of actual N, 183 pounds for corn following corn. Most of the fields that are in PCM as our East Central, or East Central Illinois, our corn following soybeans. And again, the corn, that MRTN is 167. If we look at those MRTNs over time, they're roughly in that range, that 160, 150, up to 180 pounds per, 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 uh, per acre. Um, I would note that that 167, we're using a 675 price. If you lowered that price to $5, which is probably what you're going to be thinking about for not 2022, but 2023, um, that MRTN would go lower about 20 pounds. In any case, we're looking at a, at a, Recommended from Illinois rate of around 160, 170 pounds per, per, of nitrogen per acre. Here is a look at what we've seen from, from, uh, for the past um, 2015 through 2021 as far as corn yields. And then we're going to show profitability as well for these these breakouts. So we're showing uh, nitrogen applications of below 150. 151 to 175 here, if we're looking at this, these bars right here are 151 to 175. 176 to 200 pounds per N. And again, our MRTN usually is right in that area. Then we have some farms that go up uh, 200 and higher applications of nitrogen. Here are the average corn yields, and each one of the bars there show corn yields. But if we're looking at this sort of this uh, 151 to 175 range, we're looking at 214 average corn yield. That goes up a bit, 170 or 217 for the 176 to 200, and actually continues to go up as we apply nitrogen, more nitrogen. However, and this is where the MRTN comes in, 
if we look at average operator and land returns, we do not see that go up with higher MRTNs, which is what the MRTN is supposed to do. It's supposed to find the optimal uh, range of applying nitrogen. And here we're looking at operator and land returns, which is gross revenue minus non-line non cost for $319 for the MRTN range, and then it goes down. So profitability goes down with higher nitrogen rates on average in our in our PCM study, and that just simply confirms what MRTN is, is saying about uh, nitrogen application rates. We're gonna turn next to nitrogen application timing. So in the PCM study, we look at different times of putting nitrogen on, and these are were designed by Laura a long time ago. They're, they're brilliant. But, uh, uh, we say we're looking at over 40% of the fall applications, so making most of our applications in the fall, mostly pre pant which would primarily be in the spring prior to planting, mostly side dress, so this would be after planting. And, and again, this these all say mostly because there's at least some nitrogen usually applied in DAP, or with the planter or some other way. So if you're looking at these, these, these ways would be mostly fall, mostly pre-plant, mostly side dress, and with some nitrogen going on some other way. And then we've got the split applications here, roughly, in roughly 50% pre-plant, 50% side dress. And then the three-way split here are making our nitrogen applications three ways. Here you see the number of fields in each one of these categories and the yield per acre and again yield 220 218 220 218 222 bushels per acre overall not a lot of difference in uh, average yields across these splits again we are doing these with high soil productivity ratings and we're that's all we're reporting uh, we will promise you to do low, low soil productive rating, ratings in our, in our farm doc articles coming up, but the, 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 uh, the uh, results are roughly the same if we go to low soil productivity ratings versus higher soil, pro soil productivity rates. Here, just to complete this, we're, now we're looking at returns. $299 of average returns for mostly fall, and then they go up for mostly pre-plant, mostly side dress. So the sources that use mainly, mainly non-fall applications have higher returns, and then our splits go down a little bit. In explaining that, you'll have to look, we'll look at cost here and we'll describe why that is. One thing to keep in mind is that the yields do differ a bit, but a lot of this is actually due to cost. Again, and we'll get into those costs, but just a reminder here that uh, those, uh, those benchmarks, um, there aren't really a lot of trends in their benchmarks over time. The only one that sort of picks sticks out is this is 2021, this is 2020, and this is 2019. 2019 was an outlier year, and if you go back to that year, you'll remember why that was an outlier year, because we had a lot of wet weather in fall continuing to a very late planting. But again, if you look at our fields, 31%, uh, mostly fall, 26%, mostly pre-pant, mostly side dress. Again, just like with, uh, with uh, what Sarah said about uh, cover crops, people in our in the fields in here that are mostly fall in one year are mostly fall the next year. So most of the farmers that we see here stick with one plan with the exception of that 2019 year. All right, coming back, so we don't see a lot of trends there. Here is a look at cost over, over um, those nit or nitrogen benchmarks, 40% fall, mostly pre-plant, mostly side dress. And we're dividing out these costs here by nitrogen fertilizer costs, other direct costs, total power costs, and overhead. And I'm just going to fill those in here. 
we see nitrogen cost on mostly fall to be $82 per acre on average, which actually is higher than mostly pre-plant and mostly side dress. Two things are going on here. One, well, while you might expect fall to have the lower cost because we're primarily using anhydrous ammonia, which typically is the lower cost, you're also putting a, these farmers put a little bit more nitrogen on than the other yep. uh, other other benchmarks, and we also put in here the nitrogen inhibitor. So if you're putting on in fall, that nitrogen inhibitor is built into there, and that's thirteen to fifteen dollars an acre depending on the year. So even though the anhydrous ammonia is our lower cost, uh, generally source of nitrogen, and again. This would be primarily anhydrous ammonia. These would be more, uh, more UAN in, in, in those benchmarks. The other thing to note here is then we divide out 320, 292, 308. Our fall applicators have higher direct costs, other direct costs than our other. And this is a bit, bit, Difficult to explain why that is, but uh, we do see that rather consistently that our flaw nitrogen applicators also have higher other direct costs. And I apologize again for that. And then our power costs are again higher for our nitrogen, our flaw applied versus our other. Our power costs relate primarily to trips across the field. So those are the cost breakdowns. Here are our cost, and then that there again results in, in, in our total returns. Again, we see um, fall, or excuse me, fall applicator having applications having lower returns than this mostly pre plant, mostly side dress, and then it goes down a bit as we split those out. And again, part of that is the nitrogen application rate and part of that also is the more trips you go across the field we're putting on a nitrogen application cost associated with those so that's our nitrogen timing uh results here those have been rather consistent across the years you add another year and and we don't see a lot 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 of changes across, across those years so our message from uh, continues to be as we add data our mrtn application rates tend to be the highest uh, operator and farm return so sort of that 150 to 200 pounds of actual end range tend to be the more profitable and mostly pre-plant mostly side dress tend to be our more more profitable um, nitrogen timing benchmarks we're gonna move on to tillage practices and we're only gonna show corn. Again, uh, one other thing I would note here is we just dropped in the PCM booklet in our, uh, in our download. So if you wanna see more of our results, go look at the PCM booklet. You can also get that at the Precision Conservation website. So they're, those are free, or not free, but they're free to you, but we produce them and they're available to you. All right, turning next to tillage practices. We divide uh, tillage practices out based on field passes or farm work passes, which means a tillage pass. So 18% of our farms can, are no-till, which means no tillage pass. 17% use strip till which could be more than one tillage pass, but, but strip till is, 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 is used. 33% of the fields use one pass, 12% two pass, or we divide that out, 12% two pass light, 17% two pass medium. Here you're doing something more deep. And then we have 3% of two plus passes. So that's how we break out the tillage benchmarks. I would also say that if you look at the fields or fields, farms that tend to do one pass system tend to do that same thing over time. If we look at those, and again, here's our fields, uh, here's our yields 213. Uh, no till has a bit lower yields than our strip till 218, 219, 225. So our 
two paths. We have higher, a bit higher uh, yields associated with those. And then if we look at operator and line returns, 298, 290. We're going to explain that a little bit here in a little bit. 320 for a one pass and 328 for a one two pass light systems. And then they begin going down again. All right, so those are the cost, or excuse me, operator and line return. So this would be profitability again. Gross revenue minus cost, everything but the land cost. So you would still have to be subtracting off the land cost associated with these. And then let's break down those costs. So, and, and I'm going to start here with field work. So field work on a strip till, we would have $20 of cost, of, of field work costs in there. And again, when we uh, put in cost here for PCM, this field work and other power costs, what the farmers tell us is what they did. And then we use Illinois production cost estimates to come up with cost. $20 is higher than a field a strip till pass. And a number of, of, of farms are doing, when they're doing strip till, they're doing two strip till passes or something else. Uh, one pass light, $11, $22 for two pass light. So that's essentially two passes of the system, and then you go up from there. We would also note that the power cost, so this is field work, other power cost is everything else. So that would be planting and combining, spraying, and everything else. Everything else but the custom work, um, or uh, field, field work or the tillage passes, you can see that's the majority part, part, part of that. When we look at, uh, at, at other direct costs, we see one pass light having higher, uh, excuse me, lower other direct costs. And for whatever reason, our strip tillers have higher uh, direct cost. Again, if we divide these out more by one tillage pass, this, that number tends to drop, and we're likely going to have to refine that some more over time. If we look at, at, at those are averages, well, another thing that we've done is look at uh, what's the most profitable fields by tillage class over time and, and take out, by most profitable, we're looking at the top 25% of fields. If we look at over time, that's 20, 36% of those are one pass light. Even though we note and the no till makes it up there, 22% of the fields, 17% is strip till. Those vary by year a little bit. And just to show you this, this is our, our, our uh, most profitable fields by tillage cast. Start here with one pass light 33%, 38%, 38%. 59%, 42, 32, and that catches the 37%. 2021, um, strip till came in there and, and looked really good at 30%. And in some years, it didn't do as well as, as, as in other years. So these 37%, uh, these, 22% uh, no till, and 18% 18, 18%, uh, here for strip till. Again, pointing out that um, even when we look at averages, it does mask the fact that some people are doing pretty well with no-till, some people are doing, doing, do, doing very well with strip-till as well, as, as well, compared to, uh, um, compared to um, averages. Again, I would note that we're looking at these from our high soil productivity rating, we divide this sample up into high productivity to make sure that we're not uh, biasing this by, um, by, by productivity. When we do these breakdowns by, by high and low productivity, and we'll provide more detail of that later on, uh, not today, we will, we will see that uh, the, 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 the results are roughly the same. PCM is not only about economics. In fact, it really wasn't started to be economics, I don't think. Laura may uh, 
disagree with that, but here is Laura Gentry. She's going to talk about the economic side of the side of things now. Hey, good morning, and thank you, Gary. And PCM was was really developed as a way for farmers to take charge and claim their own victories in terms of our our different environmental assets. And we started out with the focus on water quality. Um, but in recent years, as, as we all know, the, the issues around um, soil help and most recently, the big, big opportunities with lots and lots of press that we're hearing around carbon markets is another aspect of this, the environmental piece of farming that farmers now can begin start um, to be to receive some credit, some and some financial assistance on by generating carbon assets. So that's something we'd like to think about more. So we'd really like to think about um, our most valuable resource, which is our soil, how we can reduce soil erosion with our different conservation practices, with our agronomic decisions, and also, of course, how we can um, generate and maximize the carbon asset for all the different opportunities that are out there through carbon markets today. So I have to start out though talking a little bit about um, soil loss, looking at these different tillage classes. And um, let me put in a quick shameless plug that we do have another webinar coming up uh, a week, uh, next week, next Monday. And it's organized by the Illinois Soybean Association and it's free. And we'll be focusing a little bit more too on our soybean data. So um, did want you all to realize that we're talking a lot about corn here, but more soybean data coming next Monday. And you can register for that on the precisionconservation.org website. So hope you'll join our Monday webinar. Um, but did want to take a, a quick mention here and look at soil loss, looking, uh, thinking about how to reduce soil erosion. Of course, your soil is your number one most valuable resource. Anybody who has top yields will say that they started out with top soil. So how do we have uh, retain as much of that great top soil and all of the investment that we see in it? And one of the, well, let's just say the two big decisions that you can make there, if that is a priority for you, is reducing your tillage and using a cover crop. So this slide is demonstrating different soil loss estimates, estimates coming from a model, an NRCS model called the Integrated Erosion Tool that the Precision Conservation Management Program um, is able to access for each of our farmers in our program through the Field to Market platform. So we utilize the Field to Market. It's one of our main partners uh, in the Precision Conservation Management Program, and they allow us to estimate soil loss using these NRCS tools. So this one is demonstrating our soil loss by tillage class for our high SPR cornfields. So our high productivity cornfields averaged over all years of the program. And it is really clear, isn't it? That our no-till and strip-till tillage classes have about half of the soil erosion that we see for any of these other tillage classes, including these one pass light or two pass light uh, systems that um, have much lower soil disturbance at a deeper depth, but they're still breaking up the topsoil, which makes it more vulnerable to soil erosion. So if any of you stop to think about the value of the topsoil that you're losing every year, what is the value of that topsoil? Well, if you were to just go out and hire someone to bring out, bring back the topsoil that you lose every year, well, you'd be paying about $22 per ton. $22 a ton. If you figure about $30 a yard, which is right in the middle of the range, $10 to $50 that we often see for the value of, of topsoil just being hauled in, that's just strictly the replacement value of your most valuable asset. It does not include the value of the fertilizer that's in that topsoil. It does not include, of course, all the services like improving the soil tilt, improving the operability, or, or improving the water infiltration that you get from your topsoil. This is just strictly, you're losing $22 per ton. So any of those tillage classes to the right of strip till there, you can figure you're losing anywhere from $22 to $30 an acre a year by not, uh, not reducing your soil erosion. Now, let's think about those tillage classes again. 
Um, but thinking about how that might be affecting any kind of a carbon asset that you can be generating through all these different carbon credit programs of which Illinois corn growers and uh, excuse me, the precision conservation management program allows our farmers to participate. And we even help to put your data into these different um, carbon programs with your permission. If you, if you request us to help you with that, we are glad to help you. So you only have to enter all that data in once. But what we can see here is that when we are looking at our greenhouse gas emissions expressed as metric tons of CO2 equivalents per acre, and then we break it out by tillage class, we are estimating through the different tools that we use. And the primary one that we use is through a, a um, program called the Cool Farm Tool, C-O-O-L, the Cool Farm Tool, which is a tool provided by the Cool Farm Alliance, of which Illinois Corn Growers is a member. And you can see that of those, and looking at corn on high productivity fields, the only tillage class that we have that is a net carbon sink, as far as CO2 equivalents per acre, is the no-till tillage strategy. Reduced tillage is emitting about 0.31 metric tons per acre and two or more tillage classes over a metric ton per acre. So I think that's something that you might be interested in. The other great uh, management strategy for reducing soil loss and building soil carbon and getting a carbon payment is cover crops. So if we're to look now at cover crops, you can see that our two cover crop classes overwintering and winter terminal have you know about 0.6 somewhere in their uh, metric ton or yeah tons per acre of soil loss per acre compared to about 0.93 for no cover crops so obviously cover crops are very important for reducing soil erosion and back to carbon credits wow this is where cover crops really do shine and um, in some of these higher paying carbon assets, carbon schemes, farmers can make significant money by growing a cover crop. And so Sarah was saying, you know, the, the data that we were showing for financials does not include any kind of a carbon asset payment there. So you can be making anywhere, if, you know, depending on the value of the carbon, it can be 20 to $50 a ton per metric ton of CO2. Farmers can be making some significant money by growing a cover crop versus no cover crop. And so the last thing that we wanted to show is that there is also room for farmers to be generating a carbon asset through these carbon markets by reducing their nitrogen rate. And especially if you're one of these farmers that's over 225 pounds of nitrogen per acre, look at the, the reduction that you can see, uh, in which is what you get paid on in these carbon assets, the reduction that you can generate and therefore the asset that you can generate by reducing your uh, nitrogen, which is just, as Gary was explaining, a really good business decision right now, nitrogen prices being what they are. So getting your nitrogen down into that 151 to 175 range, which is this year's MRTN range, 167 this year, can really help you to generate um, some money in the, some of these carbon asset um, schemes. And with that, just wanted to quickly go over the impact that the Precision Conservation Management Program is having right now across the state. This is just for one year, just for Illinois. We have over 100,000 acres of, our, uh, of reduced tillage among the farmers in the PCM program, over 125,000 acres of in-season nitrogen fertilizer application for corn acres, and 36,000 acres of cover crops. This is not enough to help us to meet the meet the goals of the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy in one year. But what it does demonstrate is that the farmers in PCM are, are making changes, are, are moving us in the right direction for meeting goals that are going to help us to, um, to avoid agricultural regulation, help us to be better farmers, better stewards of the land, and hopefully to start um, thinking about generating some assets in our uh, different ecosystem service markets. Here is how we are impacting water quality and soil health in the PCM program. Again, just in 2021, almost 600,000 pounds of nitrate nitrogen were not um, emitted into our waterways last year. 
84,000 pounds of phosphorus were not emitted as a result of the farmers in the PCM program. And almost 125,000 tons of sediment loss was avoided as a, as a result of the farmers' decisions in the PCM program. And of course, this is just for the farmers in the program itself. It doesn't infect many of the farmers that are outside of our PCM regions and those who are just not members of the PCM program. So lots of great things happening as a result of the data that we're making available to help farmers make the best conservation decisions and the best business decisions on their farms. And so with that, I'm going to turn this back over to Todd. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Hey, thank you very much, Laura. Laura Gentry is with the Illinois Corn Growers uh, Association. She serves as a director of water quality science. She, along with Greg Goodwin, who is also with the Corn Growers and the director of PCM, you can find that at uh, Precision Conservation Management, joined us on our webinar with our University of Illinois specialist, including Gary Schnitke, agricultural economist here on the Urbana-Champaign campus of the U of I, and PhD candidate Sarah Sellers. Sarah, of course, is in the department of ACE, that's the Illinois Agricultural and Consumer Economics Department. It's a partner in this program and the Farm Doc site, along with Illinois Extension and FBFM, the Farm Business Farm Management Program. We'd also like to thank, as you're thinking about maybe some questions you'd like to ask us, the TIA Center for Farmland Research, Compare Financial, uh, Corteva AgriSciences of Farm Credit Illinois, Illinois Corn Growers Association, Growmark FS, and the Illinois Soybean Association. Uh, and uh, there are a couple of other things to think about as well. Uh, if you've got those questions, put them into the boxes and we'll get them answered. I know there's at least one sitting there. And we have, I think, one more poll for you to consider. Uh, and I'll talk to you a little bit uh, about the poll. Are you interested in enrolling in the PCM program? So yes, please have a PCM staff member contact me. Yes, when it's available in my area. No, thanks for asking. Go ahead and fill that out. And just a reminder that uh, coming up on Monday, as Laura said, there is a, a webinar. Laura, can you tell me how do they get themselves scheduled for that one? And the Illinois Sustainable Ag folks have a webinar on Monday too. That one runs from 1 to 2.30 uh, out. And it will look at uh, something you're really interested in. It'll look at tiles uh, and precision conservation management. Folks can find that at IL Sustainable Ag. Uh, look under the events to get registered for that one. But the PCM webinar is where on the PCM site? Do you remember? And how do mm -hmm. they get themselves enrolled? So it's from 10 to 11 on this coming Monday, the 27th. And if you'll go to the precisionconservation.org website, it's under a tab at the top and i think it's called like news and events oh yep i believe that's probably correct so that's easy enough to do so we'll see what your answers are to the polls and if you've got questions go ahead and put them in the boxes and we'll get those answered as well and then we have a, a place that you can scan if you want to visit the pcm website uh, once we close this poll out uh, that uh, you can just scan and get an idea of what um, the precisionconservation.org website looks like. So we do have some questions, and I don't know which one of you will want to answer this exactly, but they're, they're interested to know whether we've been able yet to collect data from people who have been using, uh, for instance, cover crops for a while, and how uh, it differs early on, and what they have to say about cover cropping after multiple years, at least on the economic side. Have we collected that data at this point? So uh, I can take that question. Um, so we, we've started thinking about this and, and working on some analysis with this, but it's still a, a work in progress here. So I don't have a an answer for your question yet, uh, but we do have 32 fields in the data set that have been in cover crops for five or more years. So we are building up uh, a really interesting um, data set there, some set of these people who have been doing this uh, for a while. And that's one thing where we are doing some research on is, uh, can we see that difference? So um, answer to come in the future. 
And another question that uh, has arrived again, the gray box uh, on the either the left side or down to the bottom. If you've got a question, you can put these in, in and we'll get them answered. Have you seen trends in tillage and cover crop adoption over the years? Gary, I suppose you've been watching this closely or maybe somebody else will be able to answer this as well. So our, our tillage hasn't really changed a lot. We've seen the same tillage benchmarks reset, stay, stay the same over time. So we're not really seeing a lot of movement across the tillage benchmarks. Cover crops, we've seen more people going, trying cover crops. Um, so we're, we're seeing more people try cover crops. By the way, and we'll have to do this sometime, the best way to do a cover crop is in a no-till situation. And if you do a no-till situation, and when we compare a no-till benchmark to no-till plus cover crops, the results come out much closer. So no-till and, and, and cover crops go, seem to go well together. And just one final note as we get ready to close out our program. No-till was born in Dixon Springs, Illinois. Mostly there are some farmers out of Kentucky that might contest that a little bit. But the first no-till planter developed in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, came out of the work that uh, folks did down in Dixon Springs. Adoption, I suppose, if you look fast, far enough back here, you can probably see no-till adoption working its way uh, northward through the state of Illinois. We do have a, another um, question that has just come in. How can or should winter wheat get recognized as a uh, a runoff reducing cover crop. Anybody thought about winter wheat so, uh, in that cover crop area, Gary? So winter wheat will act as a cover crop, obviously. It is, it's the same as a cover, cro cover crop, it's a, and it would overwinter. If you enter those in PCM, you we would calculate those, uh, the, those values based on the tools and, and models that are available. So those are specifically incorporated in, in, in those. And actually, there is some research uh, that has been done with NREC funding um, in, in Piatt County that made a comparison between corn versus soybeans and a corn uh, soybeans and a, soy, a wheat double crop soybean situation. They did find that the, 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 compared to the corn soybean situation, corn soybeans, um, wheat double crop on. It did, did do better from a nitrate tile standpoint of reducing uh, nitrate flows in tile drainage. As we close our time out together, I'll remind you to make sure that when the webinar, uh, at, at the end, when the uh, survey at the end of this webinar, when you leave, uh, pops up, please do fill that out. We'll make sure to uh, take a look at those numbers. Jim Balch, who's behind the scene, does a really good job of making sure we get everything that comes from those surveys back so that we can see it. Uh, you can see, and Jim will get this posted right away, I am sure, today's webinar on our uh, FarmDoc Daily website. And Jim, if I remember the address for YouTube correctly, it is youtube.com backslash farm doc video so you'll find this video on many others there as well uh, and we do thank you for that and one final note because i produce the illinois nutrient loss reduction podcast you can find that on the website that i host uh, for the radio station willag.org w-i-l-l-a-g.org You'll have to hit the podcast tab, but the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction podcast is there. Again, thanks to Gary Schnitke, just, Sarah just Sellers, Laura well, Gentry, and Greg Goodwin. And you have one other item. I yeah, take just, 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 just a quick, uh, sorry, Todd, but one quick note. We, in the last poll, 18% and 7%, if you added the yes together, said they would be interested in PCM. Uh, if you fill out your comments, put your name in, in the in, in, in there we will get a hold of you oh that's excellent yes so always looking for folks who are interested in this uh and one last thing one of the things i learned from the illinois nutrient loss reduction podcast from a soil scientist at iowa state university was that uh when you use no-till you put about a half a ton of carbon in the ground per year 
every two point what two acres uh i'm trying to think just i think that's right uh not per acre um but the metric side uh so if you're interested to know what that means and and it tops out i think he said around 15 uh tons uh in total so it takes some time to get there um but you can learn things like that from the nutrient loss reduction podcast as well thank you for joining us gary sarah uh, laura and greg thank you for being here and jim bolts behind the scenes thank you so much again you can find this again online at uh, farmdocdaily.illinois.edu in the archives or at youtube.com backslash farmdoc video i'm todd gleason